call, <coughs> call a meeting to order. Please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. First item on the agenda is approval or revi revision of the agenda for this evening. Is there a motion to approve the agenda? Thank you, Cindy. Second. From Daryl, any discussion? All those in favor, please indicate aye. Aye. And no one's opposed or abstaining. Next item 1.04, public comment. Mr. White. My apologies for being a little bit more disheveled than I normally am. I just got out of the hospital a few days ago, and I'm still wearing my hospital socks. So um, I can't bend over and I can't sit down either. Um, so Superintendent Tyson and I had a really productive meeting before, um, before the holidays um, to discuss kind of some clarifying some points about the, um, you know, the, the ongoing thing I've been presenting on ever since I've been here. Um, just for, for one thing, um, he, he was asking for clarification as, as when I was talking about just for homework assignments, or was I talking about for you know, broader than homework assignments? And it, it really is actually broader than that. It's really any assignment. So it could be an in-class assignment where students are like, you know, given 40 minutes to complete assignment. If they turn it in after that 40 minutes, say it's a group project or an individual project, they would get like half off or something like that if they didn't complete it in the 40 minute time span. Um, I would say fall, th this falls under that also, that they shouldn't get a zero or 50% grade for turning something in late. They should get, you know, the 64 percent threshold F grade, at, you know, as a, as, a, as a floor, if you will. So that's that. Um, the other thing that, that was discussed in our, my meeting with, with Superintendent Tice was just this idea that, um, you know, in, in his email from back from November 1st, which is circulating here, he mentioned that um, I remain adamant that about remaining, that about remanding the discussion to the committee in order to ensure that the facility, the faculty have ownership of the idea and the solution. And, you know, I've done five startups in the course of my career as a mental health professional, including some day treatment programs, which, you know, would kind of model a school environment, you know, all day long programs. And some of these programs have had to like, like whip them out like in a couple weeks, come up with like policies, you know, like dozens of policies to run a program. And, you know, I'm always thinking about my, consist my constituents, my clients, if you will. And, you know, normally the policies I come up with are great. However, there is occasion when there's, you know, maybe one or two policies slip through that aren't really good. And, you know, the, the clients will come to me and they'll say to me, they say, you know, this is, a, this is a crappy policy, Charlie, it needs to change. And nobody likes to hear that. I never like to hear it. It's happened to me repeatedly over the course of my career. And I'm just saying that this is a luxury. It's a luxury to be able to have, you know, your faculty and your staff always be able to be on top of the policies and the procedures. Sometimes you have to listen to your constituents. And in this case, we have 221 students who are saying that this policy is wrong and they're wanting change. Thank you. Thank you. Hope you feel better, Sean. Um, next on the agenda, item 2.01, curriculum report on the Tri-State Consortium Overview. Dr. Coughlin, thank you. Good evening. So uh, good evening, and uh, thank you for having us. Happy New Year. I am presenting this evening with Laurel Chiesa, our Director of Technology, and we are pleased to provide you with an update of our partnership of the Tri-State Consortium 
and our work leading up to a visit uh, from a team from the Tri-State Consortium to Fayetteville Manlius this spring. I wanna mention this presentation tool that we're using is called Canva and it's from Australia and it's a professional marketing uh, uh, tool that our teachers have completely embraced and so you're gonna be seeing a lot of this and we've been providing a lot of professional development uh, with this tool, so I wanted to share that. So as a reminder, the Tri-State Consortium is an alliance of public school districts committed go uh, committed to systems thinking and collaborative inquiry as pathways towards continuous improvement working together as colleagues and critical friends we apply the standards of the tri-state model to benchmark member districts progress in advancing teaching and learning consortium members support each other through external peer review of programs and practices study groups, conferences, and topic-based seminars designed to deepen professional learning. I included the Tri-State Consortium website for your convenience. The website has, uh, is a wonderful source of additional information about the consortium, so I would encourage you to take a look at that. The consortium consists of 45 school districts on the screen is a map of where those districts are located. In New York, they're primarily in the Westchester and Long Island area, and also uh, districts are in the consortium from New Jersey and Connecticut. So Fable Manlius is the only district in the Tri-State Consortium that is outside of that geographic area. It's really our great privilege and honor to be able to work closely with all of the consortium school districts and uh, learn from one another. It's, it's been a wonderful experience. So Fayetteville Manlius was accepted into the Tri-State Consortium in the fall of 2018. We work very closely with a gentleman by the name of Dr. Marty Brooks. He is the executive director and a former teacher and school superintendent. We have participated in training sessions that take place uh, typically in Rye, New York. We also participate in their study groups offered to superintendents, curriculum leaders, special education leaders, and um, our principals. And um, we have also participated in what the Tri-State Consortium refers to as district visits and consultancies. So as a member of the Consortium districts have the unique, um, I'm learning this tool as well, uh, the unique opportunity uh, to host a visiting team. So the host school district identifies an area of focus in teaching and learning and uh, a visiting team is compiled, typically 15 to 20 people. Uh, and that group is provided an overview of the district. They visit classrooms and conduct interviews and uh, from there, uh, the team provides recommendations to move forward. S Sorry about that. So the, we've had the opportunity to have teachers and administrators. I'm sorry, I don't know why that's doing that. I'm gonna just go off the keyboard. So there we go. So FM has had the opportunity to have teachers and administrators participate in a number of visitations. Pre-pandemic, we visited Chappaqua, Mount Pleasant, and Bronxville. And then during the pandemic, all of this was on pause. And last year, we had teachers visit uh, Hewlett, uh, Woodmere, Herricks, Pauline, Warwick, Dobbs Ferry, and you can see the topics of areas that we um, we focused in on, and then from Brewster, Wilton, a second visit to Chappaqua, New Canaan, and Southampton, those will be visitations that we will be sending teachers and administrators on um, this school year. When we attend these visits, we are learning from these districts and providing recommendations for their growth and advancement. Additionally, as a indirect benefit, we learn from these districts and bring that knowledge back to Fayetteville Manlius. So that's that's been a great, great aspect of this uh, partnership.
So we have scheduled a visit to Fayetteville Manlius uh, that will take place for three days in May, May 17th through the 19th. As a school district, we have identified the focus of that visit to be in the area of instructional technology. And Laurel will tell you more, a, a little bit more about our rationale for that in just a moment. The goal of the visit, as stated by the Tri-State Consortium, will be to provide FM with the visiting team's best thinking about our program, instructional technology, while also pointing to the next level of work. It's really important to underscore that the Tri-State model is not a deficit model, but rather a means to highlight and celebrate ways in which we are being successful, then pointing us to the next level of work um, in this area. We have a number of individuals who are helping to plan the FM visit. It, it really has been all hands on deck since we scheduled this visit. Uh, the District Curriculum Council is the primary steering committee to oversee planning and provide direction for our visit. We also have a couple of subcommittees working on areas such as the schedule, who we're interviewing, uh, hospitality, which is very important. Uh, Laurel and our computer resource teachers, Tim Thielen, Steve Carbone, and Amy Fiorito have been heavily involved in the planning and preparations. I'm incredibly appreciative of, of their work uh, within this area. Also, all along the way in this process, we have been in close contact with Dr. Brooks from the consortium, who's providing us a, a great deal of guidance. When the team comes in May, we will be housed at Wellwood for the first two days. We chose Wellwood because of the history of Wellwood at FM and also because the district, or excuse me, the building is centrally located and that'll be much more convenient for the team. On the first day, uh, we will start by presenting an overview of Fable Manlius, our work with instructional technology and our strategic plan. On that day, the team will also be reviewing evidence of instructional technology that we will be providing. Laurel is going to share more about that in just a moment and provide some examples um, that we already have gotten from the teachers. On uh, day one, the team will also be heading out to conduct classroom visits throughout the district. On the second day of the visit, the team will be continuing those visits and also conducting uh, interviews with teachers, administrators, and our technology support staff. And on the th third and final day, uh, we will be at the high school library and participating in what the consortium refers to as a fishbowl. The visiting team will be in front of an audience of FM teachers and administrators and um, debriefing about their visit, identifying successes and strengths, and also providing recommendations to the district to advance our work with instructional technology. We will also receive a formal report from the consortium and they will return to Fable Manly as it's typically in a year, maybe two years, uh, to check in on our status and provide any additional support um, that they uh, could offer. In addition to identifying the area of focus of instructional technology, we as a district provide the essential questions to the visiting team to assist them to specifically focus in on what we would like feedback on. Our essential questions were generated with Dr. Brooks and our district curriculum council. The first is to what extent is instructional technology aligned and integrated into the district's curriculum and instruction. In this area, we're looking uh, to see how our work with instructional technology is aligned along the K through 12 uh, continuum and how the New York State standards in computer science and digital fluency, um, how those learning standards are integrated uh, into the curriculum. The second essential question is to what extent does instructional technology benefit the broad range of learners at Fayetteville Manlius? Here we will be um, seeking feedback in such areas such as access and uh, differentiation, uh, student differentiation, et cetera. The third question uh, 
a central question, to what extent are teachers provided professional learning appropriate to the integration of instructional technology into their work with students? We know that we provide a great deal of professional learning for our teachers in this area, but we would like and look to the visiting team to provide suggestions for additional and alternative ways in which we can provide professional learning to support our teachers. And then finally, in addition to the essential questions, the visiting team will look at indicators for uh, organizational success. The tri-state model has eight indicators, um, and we are, will be benchmarked uh, in the areas of curriculum and instruction and professional learning. So we're really, really excited about this. I'm, I'm gonna turn it over now to Laurel, who will present an overview of what we precisely mean by instructional technology, why we chose instructional technology, and how we're gathering some evidence from the teachers. Great, thank you. Don't put anything on the keyboard. Okay, all right. Good evening, everybody. Um, good to see you. Uh, so what is instructional technology? We took the definition from um, New York State. We have some new standards that I'll get into in, in a few minutes. But pretty much, um, we're looking at the teacher use and student use of technology, not just the, the pr products that the students create, but also how teachers are using it every day, their morning meetings, as they're going throughout the day, and even after school. So, this is, so we took this definition from the standards. Um, why instructional technology? Um, you know, a couple of years ago, we were all immersed in, 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 in instructional technology, and prior to that, um, anytime we had vendors do trainings with, our, with the teachers or our OCM BOCES do training, I was also provide, always provided feedback at how um, accomplished our teachers are with the use of technology, and this just really brought it up to another level, uh, just how they just, took on all the challenges of technology. So we want to celebrate that and share that, all those accomplishments. Um, it also, Mary and I have been attending the, the meetings. We uh, have been going to the faculty meetings, curriculum meetings. I've been to some department meetings at the high school. And it really brings everyone together. So, you know, nice sense of unity that, that we're all on the same page, that everyone will be submitting um, the work, and that everyone feels uh, very confident about their work with instructional technology. Um, one part that I'm going to talk about in a few minutes is we do have the new New York State um, Computer Science and Digital Fluency Standards, and um, you know we've been working on it. We started working on it prior to COVID because I, you know, I was privy to that information. I helped with the feedback, so we're in a good place right now. But this is going to really help us determine and have great examples for when we have full implementation. And of course, professional learning, you know, we have all these expectations for the teachers, but how are we doing with supporting them with our in-service, our meetings, et cetera? Um, and we really welcome all the recommendations that our downstate um, colleagues will have for us. So the standards, so these are the, the new standards, and in a minute I'll give you the timeline, but um, in, impacts of computing is new, and that includes ethics, so uh, students will be learning about the ethics, taking, for example, social media um, products and how they deal with privacy. Um, also accessibility in some other areas. Computational thinking has been on the table for a long time for one of the standards. That's pretty much coding, algorithms, the math, science relationship to computers. Um, networks and system design is new, which is great. It's a very small part of it, but still it's, it's great to see, you know, looking at big data, big systems, um, s the cloud. It's really important for our students to, to have an understanding of all of that. Cybersecurity, another great addition to the standards. Uh, it's in the news a lot. We feel like we're living it. Um, every time you, you get an email, you're wondering about it. So it's important for our students that, who are using the technology all the time to have that experience. Um, and then digital literacy is, has evolved from digital citizenship and internet safety. And what's great about this is that it just really teaches them to be critical readers of of the media and of the website. So this is, again, another great addition. So those are our new standards, and um, this is a timeline. So full implementation by September 2024. So getting back to, um, to the tri-states, um, so having those, knowing those standards, we'll be collecting evidence from the teachers, 
And we in the background will be aligning and, and providing, getting those examples so that we can then share those out. Um, so what types of evidence are we asking for? So we are asking again for everybody, we want to make sure whether you're a counselor, phys ed teacher, that we know you're using this technology, so um, share that with us. So from student projects to assessment tools, VR, you know, whether it's videos or printouts, whatever. So I just wanted to uh, quickly show you, um, is this a touch screen? Okay. Uh, this is a, a sample of a, um, of the form. So it just reminds them of what the standards, the essential questions and the standards, and then just a tutorial to help them get through. Um, but again, we're, we're collecting from buildings, and there might be teachers that are from multiple buildings, multiple grade levels. Again, there might be again, some interdisciplinary. We have um, been provided lots of interdisciplinary um, projects. And then again, the type of uh, evidence that I pointed out, is it more teacher-based or student results or student mastery? And then we're just gonna have them name the project, activity, lesson, and then this is gonna be really helpful right here. How did you learn? This is gonna help us with our professional learning piece. Did you learn this on your own? Were you at a conference? And this is just really nice information for us for the instructional technology team to have. And then they can either provide a link if they're using it, if they've got it saved in Google Drive, or they can attach or add a file. So that's what the, um, that's what the form looks like. So some examples of teacher-driven um, examples. So the top one is actually a lesson plan, and this is from um, a special education classroom where they are, they are differentiating um, the levels of the students by using very different pieces of technology, and so they're using that into one lesson. So that was a great submission that we received. This other one is a presentation that we have teachers who you've heard in the past, our VIS, um, team, they're very knowledgeable, so they've been training other teachers in the district, so all the other special ed teachers are knowledgeable in that. So we'll be including all these wonderful trainings that our teachers do do. Uh, and then on the right, this is a, um, an author Skype. So again, something that the teacher is facility, facilitating or setting up is an example. Um, so what we do from that form, that data gets populated to a spreadsheet. And from that spreadsheet, we've set up a merge. It's very similar to a mail merge. And we have it populating to, this is what we have so far for our cover sheet. We might tweak it a little bit. But um, the visiting team does need, you know, what type of course, the grade level, subject area. And then they, we have a summary. And then there's also some, then they, you can see here how this teacher put some, uh, put the links. So I'm just gonna click on that. Oh, actually, I think I have it. One more over. Okay, so this is so this is the how the teacher used technology to introduce the, the lesson, and this is a, a German class where the students are um, supposed to be. They're in Munich, and they're use. It's almost like an Airbnb, and they're they're finding an apartment to make an advertisement in, um, in German. So that's this the, stu the, the teacher's use of it, technology, and then this would be one sample. And this teacher added uh, three or four samples of the student work. I also add another example um, to show that this it isn't only just in the classroom activities, but this, this is, um, I'll show you that this piece of evidence is sort of an extension. So in science and math, when a student is interested in a content area and there isn't that time during the classroom day, um, that, that that student can go on their own and they could uh, self-initiate learning about those, um, those content areas. So this is just an example of how technology, and you can see what, between the visuals and the links, et cetera, and the, and the formatting. So those are two quick examples. So once we're done with that, we'll do a little celebration, and we'll be reading the report. So the report will be pretty comprehensive. Someone comes with the team, and they follow along with the interviews, and they will write up the report. And then there is follow-up to see how we've done meeting those um, suggestions that they have provided for us. And that's, that's the end of our presentation. So if you have any questions, 
I just really want <clears throat> to highlight the importance of this relationship and how meaningful it's been to everybody who's been able to go on the trainings and go on the visitations and just uh, it's just been a really phenomenal experience and the, the new colleagues that we've met at these districts it's just been tremendous so Sarah, please. Uh, thanks for this update it sounds really interesting um, I'm wondering how did we select how do we normally select the teachers and administrators who get to travel and participate in the different workshops in the um, tri-state consortium it begins with um, generally we when we started we started talking about this with uh, district curriculum council so they were the most aware and then they would so we had several people from district um, curriculum council go on those initial visits and then we've since then asked our D DCC members to uh, talk about this at their departments we've been to faculty meetings and um, so we just put it out there who might be interested similarly with uh, administrators we um, ask who's who's interested people express interest and we you know clearly can't send everybody to every visit um, it's usually uh, we well we have two people going to training in January we had three go in December so it's sort of a smattering like that. So then when they come back, is there, did they give a presentation to their mm -hmm. department or the building or how does that information get disseminated? Right. So we deb debrief, um, at times there have been presentations back to district curriculum council and then DCC members are sort of the conduit for information. Uh, we also have filed all that information, all the reactions, all the, all everything that we learned from that visit, uh, even notes about the logistics of the visit. All of that, we have that all kept in in uh, files. Yes. See technology. Um, <laughs> this is why I need help. When you talked about doing classroom visits and interviews, are you going to have any of the kids present yeah. what they have done and, and what they are engaged in or what they would like? Yes, absolutely. Uh, so some of that will be scheduled and some of that will just happen as a, as a classroom visit occurs. And also, I, I don't think I mentioned, te uh, students will be interviewed as well. I'm sorry, we, we normally don't take questions from the audience at this point, but if you have a question that you'd like to write down, um, we can make sure we get a response to you. Thank you. Um, so my question, I, you said that um, about making sure that, a, a big focus is making sure that all students are having access to the technology. So they're gonna be looking at areas like special education then, or in our, our ENL students, and what other, groups might they be looking at? So we're gathering evidence from all of those areas and keeping copious records and files of that. The idea is that when the team comes here, in addition to the classroom visits and the interviews, they will be provided with this evidence across all grade levels, across all areas, that should give them a snapshot of, of what occurs at Fayetteville Manlius and it will be their uh, role to kind of look to see where we might be able to uh, make some different kinds of inroads or some suggestions. Yeah, you want to talk about I was just going to add that that's why we went to, to every meeting we could <laughs> to make sure we got the word out to everyone they received the same message so yes we want it all mm -hmm. definitely we want to have a nice picture of how it's used everywhere and then the feedback too, you know uh, how we are doing in that area. It's really been all hands on deck. I, again, we've been a road show around the district and district curriculum council has been, been wonderful, our computer resource teachers. Um, and that aspect of this planning of the visit is wonderful as well, it's, it's, it's unifying. We're all kind of working on the same issue. I was just curious with the, the feedback process, it sounds like a detailed report is issued and there's check-ins. So then I assume you have to develop some sort of plan to, to work on that follow-up. But have you seen what other districts have done with their site visits? Um, 
in terms of what that looks like on the back end, you know, on the other end of the site visit? We don't have access to the formal report that goes to a, a district, but when we have been on the uh, part of a visiting team, we're part of the fishbowl and part of the recommendations. And in the uh, visiting team will also make recommendations about a timeline. They might also, how you might, a uh, district might incorporate into a strategic plan, ideas for district uh, building level goals. Um, so it's, it's really wide open. Yeah, and they have, like, they have a rating system too. Yeah, sorry. Oh. <laughs> but we'll, be, yeah, we'll have a numerical rating system also and then comments and specifics. Mm -hmm. And I believe Dr. Coughlin, you and Dr. Kilmer participated in a revisit. Was it Bronxville? You did, did the initial? Yes. We went, um, uh, Dr. Kilmer and I went to Bronxville and looked at their program called the Bronxville Promise. That was before the pandemic. Um, it's how they incorporate inquiry and leadership into their instruction. And then there, we did have a follow-up. Uh, it was about a year and a half later. Um, and provided additional recommendations. And again, very specific about how they might uh, incorporate, where they might incorporate, and what they might look like in a strategic plan. I'm also just wondering, curious, was it a hard choice to, to drill down to the topic area you wanted for the site visit? Were there other close contenders? Yeah. <laughs> uh, we wanted an area where um, that could involve everybody. So, so as you saw, some of the topics up there are, are more narrow in focus. So K through five writing or, um, you know, high school science. So we really wanted an area where uh, everybody in the district could be involved. Instructional technology touches every aspect of our organization. So that was really important to us. Um, also, it's just the, the rate of change, as, as Laurel mentioned, has been so, uh, crazy <laughs> that it, it w really is an area that we feel like we can really benefit from the feedback so thank you and just one related question uh, our membership started in 2018 so is there any renewal of membership into tri-state or once you're in you're in I just need a refresh on that piece uh, typically once you're in you're in we just pay the dues every year Okay. Yeah, thanks. Thank you very much. Okay. Appreciate it. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Next item, 2.02, is a president's report. Um, so we had um, discussed getting a, our board DEI committee going, and then there was also discussion about a mental health committee. And um, I was thinking that that might be one committee, um, just because I think that there's some overlap there. and. Quite frankly, DEI involves support of our students with mental health issues, so I wanted to get some feedback or what the board's thoughts were on having that be one committee that focuses DEI, but under DEI is also mental health. You mean for the board ad for hoc the board, committee, not the board the ad hoc committee, not the district one, sorry. There's definitely crossover, mm -hmm. but I think there's also a place focus-wise, time-wise, number of times you meet and things that can be covered that can and perhaps should be separated out or, or might be more effectively dealt with by having this as two different committees. I think there are some areas where there's obvious intersection where they could meet jointly on those topics um, or subtopics, but I think in my view, they should be separate. As far as what the committee's charge would be? Well, yes, it's, he's certainly correct that there are some issues that are just mental health and there are some that overlap. Um, I think in, in looking at it, I was thinking that because DEI, D 
is a broader area. It, it does have mental health as a focus that it would seem a natural fit to have it under there. Like we wouldn't have separate committees to address um, different um, ethnic groups or different religious groups, et cetera. It's all under that same umbrella. But you know, I, I do um, fully understand that perspective that it, um, there are certain um, times when it would be helpful to have a specific um, focus on mental health. So I'm not um, you know, holding form to this. I just I wanted to get some feedback before, because there was an idea that came up in discussion, um, I think during agenda planning, so I wanted to bring it to the full board to see what your thoughts were. But I'm comfortable going forward in either way, in either direction. Uh, Sarah, then what was your hand up? OK, then Rebecca. Um, so I would, you know, thinking more about when we've talked about the ad hoc committees, I, and I don't want to steal your thunder later, Dr. Tice, when you talk about the mental health update, but um, I wasn't 100% clear on, you know, we have the community-based um, DEI committee that's getting started in January or early February, and then it looks like there's going to be a mental health task force also. So does it make more sense to have just like board representation um, somehow on those two so that way we're getting recommendations directly from those committees. I just, I'm not sure if we're all, I, I would hate to have us um, have everybody working in different directions and trying to do the same thing but not all aligned so with multiple committees. So I just wondered if we could take advantage of the ones that are already being set up. So are you saying that instead of having the, the board subcommittees, just have board members participate in some, I just want to make sure I understood. That's what I'm no, wondering, if that makes more mm -hmm. sense sure. as opposed to having a separate committee that could be overlapping the same work and that the community committee is doing. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. Okay, Rebecca? Okay, um, so I'm thinking about the task force, um, the DEI, I mean, if we're calling it a task force. So to me, we've had an ad hoc DEI committee. We need, we need to be working together on, I think to have an ad hoc committee, it's, it's only worth it if they're sort of charged with some specific work to do. So I've been hoping that if we do create an ad hoc DEI committee, or we don't, the, the board members that are more focused on that issue are helping lead forward, work with the administration on, uh, possibly work with the administration on what's the agenda look like, you know, what is the work to be done for the task force. And I think the same thing could be said of the mental health piece. So I, I would prefer to see two separate focus areas, whether we have a separate ad hoc committee or not, I think it should be the same board members that are on sitting on those task force that are helping take a leadership role in, in tailoring you know, the conversations, the agenda, facilitation, not that they're facilitating, but selecting, helping guide facilitation. Um, I think we need to be really targeted in, in our roles. So to me, there's enough work to be done on both issues that we would divide and conquer. Other thoughts from the board? I agree with uh, what Rebecca and Sarah said. I think we're taking on two huge issues. And while there are crossover moments, I think we can meet at those moments of crossover. But there's so much to cover. I think mm -hmm. having two committees would be a good idea. So what I'm hearing is keep them, the ad hoc committee separate, and then connect the folks who are on the ad hoc committees to the task force. So that they are have, they have a role on there, and then that way the when the board committees are meeting, they can bring that work or have that work in their mind as they work with the administration um, for future policy work. Is that correct? Is everyone okay with that? Yes, task force. So mm -hmm. those people would be natural. Like, okay. All right. Great. Thank you. Um, I hope I'm not stealing this from your report, Dr. Tice. I think I was supposed to say that Mr. McMahon is coming to Wellwood on February 1st. 
Oh, they changed it to the 8th They now. changed it to the 8th okay. due to a scheduling conflict. Okay, so he's coming to talk about Micron in schools. So he will be, do we have a time on February 8th? 6.30. 6.30, there we go. Sorry about that. Um, so if uh, board members, if you'd like to come, that would be great. So then the last thing on my, um, on my report for this evening, in our last board meeting, we had a very good um, lengthy discussion in regards to um, the um, mental health, um, the biomass um, survey or that was being uh, administered to our students. And the, you know, um, there were some concerns that were brought to the board, uh, students, how students felt about it. And you know, as a board, we are tasked with asking questions, tough questions, uh, challenging questions sometimes about how different um, programs are working in our community. But we never want to give the impression that we are moving from our area of governance and policy into the administrative area. And um, unfortunately, I think that that sort of happened in our last discussion. And I do want to um, speak to that. When I first came on the board, or one of the um, board members there um, told me that there's, there's a black and white with the administration and the board. But there's also this gray area of tension where things overlap and where there has to be this um, high level of communication and discussion because we're, we're in that gray area and it's not our own separate silo areas. And that's something that's always stuck with me and something that we always, as a board, I think, need to be mindful of and, and look at and evaluate um, constantly. Um, so with that in mind, um, we have a retreat coming up where we're going to be looking at the issue of religious holidays, et cetera, on the calendar. And I think this would be a good opportunity to sort of have a, to discuss that with two of our administrators um, so that we have, we can start working on that communication piece, that dialogue, getting their perspective, talking about it from our role. And I think it would be just a very good exercise in, because we have a lot of new board members and um, I think it would be helpful because that is an issue that is something that we're all uh, really want to look at. But as a board, we also need to be mindful of what it looks like from the building's perspective. And I think this might be a good discussion to have together. It's already on the retreat agenda. We can invite um, Heidi and Ray perhaps to come in and to meet with us on that particular issue and have a good dialogue. I think it would be a good step forward. I think there's other things we need to do to debrief from that discussion, but I think that's something that we could do that would be beneficial towards our working together because we don't want to um, create circumstances where our, our, our staff feel like you know, they, you know, watching the board meetings with bated breath and, and wondering, oh my goodness, you know, when, we, when that's not our intention at all. Um, so I think that um, having this kind of a discussion might be helpful for us all at this point. I was <laughs> just waiting for someone else to chime in. So I guess, I, I, um, Dr. Tice, I'd, I'd be interested in your thoughts on this because um, it's not clear to me what um, we could have done differently during that meeting in discussion to make it seem as though we were not giving a directive to the administrators from your perspective because um, I, you know, I've expressed my um, view of it that after re-watching it, I, I thought we were asking questions and offering suggestions and feedback, and it's, um, it's honestly not clear to me where we potentially, if that's the interpretation, cross the line in terms of giving direction, or at least that was the message that was conveyed. So I'm curious what you feel about that. Well, I think it certainly was, you know, a highly charged meeting and emotional given the speakers at the podium. And so I think certainly we want to do what's right but for the students and for the organization. But it is clear in that dialogue, and you're right, I don't think we landed in any particular place other than there was concern 
in the middle of administering what we were doing for the screener and we were under a tight timeline. So any kind of pause, I know, I think some people thought it was just gonna be a 24 hour thing and we were gonna be right back to it. I mean, it really ended up kind of scuttling the whole plan for that in terms of going forward. In terms of the, the feeling, I think as, as I walked away and I think as others walked away, I think there's a concern at the other levels, especially, you know, I, I kind of look for the litmus test, concern at the elementary level where the teachers have to administer the by mass as opposed to the students taking the survey. And their concern, and from what I've heard, is, you know, does, is the board gonna have our back? Is, is, can we go ahead and administer, you know, are we gonna be questioned if we check one box? versus another box. So I think some have walked away wondering, you know, are they putting themselves on the line in terms of filling it out on behalf of the students? And they're going early February because they have to observe the students and they can't have a vacation to take away from that. So I th agree with President Mims. I think communication could have been better and certainly I'm willing to do my part, but I think there was a general feeling from those watching the meeting to everything that things were kind of sensitive in terms of that there was a fear that it wasn't anonymous, it wasn't confidential. Um, as you read in the backup information, Dr. Kilmer took it upon himself to put together a kind of a climate and culture survey based on Sheldon Cohen's perceived stress scale, which is what he used in his dissertation, which had accountability and validity and reliability checks. And so that's something you know, the student group that we were meeting with thought it would give a pulse of a lay of the land, if you will. It wouldn't help us identify a particular individual. It would be like searching for a needle in a haystack, but it certainly would go some way towards getting an understanding of the student body in general and would be anonymous and confidential as I think Victoria had brought up. But there is still a compelling need to do the by mass in order to be able to identify particular students in crises and possibly have those conversations that I think are important with the counselors. Sarah, in terms of what we could have done better as a board, um, one thing I could have done better is to manage the conversation and say, you know, we're asking tough questions here, but we're not making decisions. Because even though like we vote to make decisions, but the perception, people watched the body language, they watch what we're saying, the questions that we're asking. So just even from you know my perspective, um, what I should have done is said, you know, this is a very charged conversation. We're not giving direction here, we're asking questions and, and made that very clear. Um, that that's what we were doing and this wasn't like we were trying to change path past uh, the the path that people were on but we do recognize that you know there were some really serious concerns from our students we wanted to make sure that they felt heard and that they felt validated um, but we certainly weren't attempting to um, undermine our, our administration and our teachers and our counselors in any way so you know just from my perspective sitting here with the gavel that's what I should have done better you know I can't remember what the topic was but there was another instance where we were having a discussion and I can't remember what it was, maybe it was related to goals or something. And I think the building principals might have been presenting their building level goals at that point. And we wanted to reassure them that we weren't, as we were discussing possible goals, we weren't going to be like superseding, you know, taking over what they were doing or, or kicking that, you know, aside. It was just the board working through a process. So, you know, ask what we can do better. That's, that's one thing I will definitely make sure I do better. So, Dr. Tice, we're, we're all confused on the follow-up of that meeting is, is I didn't, and I've gone back and listened to it twice. Uh, there wasn't directive, there were questions. I don't think anybody on the board, first of all, questioned the need or applicability of the testing itself. They had conversations and concerns about um, how people were being notified, how it was being communicated, and the treatment of confidentiality. And there were suggestions made of possible paths to doing that. 
But what we don't have any insight into is, is I know you started texting, you said you started texting during the meeting. Um, I assume with Heidi and Ray, but I don't, I don't know that. But what we don't really have any insight into is what was that communication? What was communicated out to Heidi and Ray? Because by 9.30 that night, an email went out to the senior class saying everything was paused. So somehow between 8.30ish, 8.20ish, and 9.30, a decision was made, a communication was written, a communication was sent. Um, so what I'm just not clear on is what was communicated. Was it communicated that the board has concerns? Was it communicated that the board has directed X? Or was there a discussion after you left our meeting before that email went out to make a decision about whether to continue or not continue? The decision was to pump the brakes and stop it. There's nothing that would have happened between a Monday night board meeting and a Tuesday morning administration other than to call a timeout from the administration. So those were the text messages that were taking place. Given the concerns on confidentiality and anonymity that you referred to, there was no way, given the planning that went into that, as you could see from Ms. Green's memo, I mean, nothing was going to happen in the wee hours of Monday night to Tuesday morning that was going to change how the BIMAS was going to be administered, part two, to the senior class. So are you saying that the pause was, that decision was made over in the evening because they needed time uh, uh, to address the concerns that were discussed at the board Correct. meeting yeah. before did, it started that's again? That's what I okay. texted, yeah. Okay, so um, again, I just want to have that discussion and we will keep working on that. Um, because we do want our staff to feel supported and our students to feel supported. Um, so is everyone in good with having them come to the retreat to discuss that calendar? Is that, is that, I'm waiting for shaking of heads so I can make sure. Dan, you good? Okay, all right, all right, so we will do that. Um, that's all I have for my report. So we'll move into Dr. Tice's first superintendent's report. Certainly, for item 2.03, superintendent report, the information's in your board docs. Under capital project update, as you are aware, we're awaiting final approver, approval from state ed facilities planning for the upcoming high school capital improvement project. So hopefully we'll be able to go out to bid during the winter months. Accordingly, construction would begin sometime in the late spring beginning with the installation of the modular classroom, classrooms, which were used at Wellwood, is swing space. With a change in project managers at State Ed Facilities Planning, there have been a number of architectural and engineering issues that have been raised by the new project manager. And as he does his due diligence to become familiar with the project, we remain hopeful that this does not delay us in going out to bid this winter. Under asbestos abatement this summer, as discussed at the recent facilities committee meeting, there will be asbestos abatement taking place this summer in House 2 at the high school. In the past, we have not allowed students or staff to be in a building while asbestos abatement is taking place. Because the impending magnitude of the high school construction project, it's our desire to allow House 1 to be utilized this summer for sport camps, community theater, while the abatement is underway. This is allowed because the ventilation systems are separate and a hard barrier will be installed between House 1 and House 2 where the abatement will take place. The rationale behind this decision is that in all likelihood, the high school will be off limits during the summers of 24 and 25 when the capital project uh, is under full swing. Hate speech workshop at Eagle Hill. As you may be aware, Ms. Maureen McChrystal building principal and her planning committee are organizing a student workshop in response to the recent hate speech that manifested itself at Eagle Hill. 
Ms. McChrystal's intention is that it's modeled after the opioid awareness workshop that has been well received in the past by the greater community and has been made portable to other schools such as Wellwood. Under UPK update, I'm pleased to report that the UPK registration has commenced for the 23-24 school year. An article has been posted to the district website to announce this process and signs have been installed throughout our campuses by our buildings and grounds department. Under DEI committee, invitations for the 40 member DEI committee will soon be mailed to the individuals from those who volunteered this autumn. You'll remember we had over 130 that were interested. Representatives were chosen to represent the eight stakeholder groups identified in the DEI regulation governing this committee, including students, parent guardians, administration, faculty members, support services staff, non-instructional staff, Board of Ed members and community members. We've pulled from individuals that have been on HSAs and parent council and have a history of participating in the governance of those organizations. Under electric bus update, Mr. Brad Corbin will provide an electric bus update at the next regularly scheduled Board of Ed meeting on February 13th. He'll also be in the process of verifying calculations from Mr. Furlong regarding the veterans tax exemption at that same meeting. If it's the pleasure of the board, you will have to act by March 1st in order to meet the statutory deadline regarding the veterans tax exemption. As mentioned by President Mims, the county executive will speak on February 8th uh, regarding the Micron initiative. Uh, it'll be at Wellwood Middle School and we anticipate it beginning around 6.30 following uh, the student rehearsals for their school musical. Congratulations to our student-athletes. I'd like to congratulate our varsity interscholastic athletic teams for a wonderful fall sports season that was replete with a number of scholar athletic teams as recognized by NISPA. And then last but not least, we'd like to thank Mr. Gordon. I'd like to thank him for his service to the Fayetteville Manlia School District over the past 16 plus years. It's bittersweet as we enthusiastically welcome his replacement, Ms. Lisa Wade, who's with us this evening as our new Assistant Superintendent for Personnel. But we would be remiss if we did not express our gratitude for Mr. Gordon's meritorious service to his alma mater. Thank you, sir, for a job well done. That ends my first report. Any questions for the superintendent on that report? Um, so with regards to the hate speech workshop, um, I understand it's going to take place on the half day. Um, yes, and January is the, 27th. Is there already a plan to also do it at Wellwood and at the high school, or is that we'll wait and see what feedback we get? At this point, I think that's the intent, is to see how it goes and what tweaks need to be made. And um, I guess related to that, I'm wondering, I don't know what the timing is of the DEI committee getting up and running, but I'm wondering if maybe there's an opportunity for those members to have exposure to that workshop, um, maybe when they start to get kicked off. <clears throat> Certainly, uh, we've reached out to uh, potential facilitators. So that's what we're waiting to hear back on is uh, to see uh, their college professors to determine if they have evening classes on a particular night of the week and just like Dr. Schilkraut who helped with the safety and security task force from SUNY Oswego, she had a preference as to which night to meet. So again, we anticipate end of January, early February, but certainly we can, as we send the invites out, uh, we can certainly give them some exposure to that. I don't think I'd have them come the day of with the kids, but certainly the station work. I know. The opioid awareness uh, workshop was very well received given it was hands on. Just a quickie. Did the county executive call you to invite himself, or did you invite him, or how did that come about? Uh, for the Micron, it was in, with respect to uh, Mayor Olson, has been acting as the media intermediary trying to get this organized. So we thought we had it for the first, but I know uh, there's a conflict that came up pushing it to the eighth. So I just took 
let's work backwards on that. So there have been a series of forums of local governance teams on Micron. Have you been part of or invited to those or part of those at all to this point? I've been invited to some, but I've had conflicts. And then certainly there's been some that have been in the northern suburbs where the plant will be located that I haven't been invited to. I know there was one at the most that Dr. Coughlin represented because of a conflict with the committee meeting here on campus. Um, on <laughs> state ed, lovely that there had to be a change over on that, of course. Um, and I know you've updated us through, but as of today, <laughs> is there anything new that's outstanding question-wise on the applications that have been made? Is there anything else that's been raised to this point? Other than that initial list, uh, thanks to Mr. Corbin's efforts, we've scheduled kind of a impromptu OACM meeting just to see exactly where we are with that. So what things have been checked, what boxes have been checked, and what still needs to be done. So we're cautiously optimistic that the bids will take place this winter, but this new project manager is doing his due diligence and going through it with a fine-tooth comb, which is interesting from our perspective, to say the least, seeing we did the third-party review to try to expedite it along. So am I safe to assume that we're not going to have bid packets out in January? We'll know more after the upcoming OACM meeting this week. Okay. But I can certainly do a Friday update to the board Thank uh, after you. that. Just because there's time before our next facilities, I mean, I just want to know where we're at. I'll give you plenty of time to panic as facilities <laughs> chair. And my, and my last question. <laughs> Great, awesome. My last question is just hey, if you could talk to Scott on the scholar athletes part. So one of the things that happens with, with most of these teams is, is those determinations don't get made until obviously after their seasons are completed, their banquets are done. And there are some district-wide notifications that go out that various teams have been awarded these things, but very frequently the student athletes themselves don't hear anything about that in any formal capacity or sometimes don't find out about it till the next season the following year. Um, and frankly, that's scholar, athlete scholar being first, probably the most important byline award that they can receive in any season. So if there's a way to better coordinate the communication out to the student athletes on that, that would be outstanding. I certainly can check in with our athletic director. Any other questions on the first report? I will go into Dr. Tice's mental health update. Uh, also for 2.04, it's in board docs as well. Uh, Mental Health Mondays, I'd like to thank Mr. Will DeSantis for organizing his presentations that were delivered virtually on Mondays throughout December. Will's presentations addressed important topics such as More Than Sad, which was developed by the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, QPR gatekeeper training designed to elevate gatekeeper, uh, caregivers into gatekeepers by educating them about the warning signs of a suicide crisis and how to respond. And then It's Real, Teens and Mental Health, which is a program uh, to raise awareness about mental health issues commonly experienced by students. Second item, a letter to the county executive. As you are aware, I wrote a letter to the county executive after he reached out to set up a meeting. In the letter, I attempted to convey the asks that has been uh, addressed by a number of speakers at our most recent public comment period during the regularly scheduled Board of Education meeting on December 12th. I reached out again last week uh, to his office in an attempt to connect, but we have been playing telephone tag. Anonymous survey instrumentation, I wanted to publicly acknowledge Dr. Kilmer for proposing an anonymous survey based on Sheldon Cohn's perceived stress scales. Dr. Kilmer and I met with a group of students and so that they could provide input into the construction of this confidential survey that would provide feedback about the climate and culture of FM High School. Doctor indicated a desire to pilot the instrument before its first administration, which is TVA. 
mental health task force and other news we're looking forward to moving ahead with a mental health task force made up of both internal and external community stakeholders to discuss our mental health initiatives going forward I'll continue to report out uh, regarding the mental health task force as it gets underway in the weeks and months ahead Biomass 2 administration, I'd like to report that the Biomass 2 mental health screener, as you know, has been administered in grades 7 and 8 at both Wellwood and Eagle Hill. The elementary schools will soon follow in early February for teacher administration of the Biomass to students in grades 6 and below. At the high school, we anticipate the administration uh, of the Biomass will restart at the end of March, as I know the counselors have a busy schedule ahead. And finally, under the mental health RFP update, I'd like to thank Dr. Melissa Carmen for providing answers and attending the December's Board of Ed meeting in order to respond to any of your follow-up questions about her proposal. I know that she and her team were looking forward to beginning many of those initi initiatives outlined in her proposal, and she has reached out to Heidi uh, to discuss those. That ends my mental health update. Questions for Dr. Tice? Um, so I'm wondering if the Biomass administration, were there any changes made um, to the communication to students or anything based on our feedback? At this point, uh, using exactly what was done before. I think they're trying to be as discreet as they can. Uh, if there was a misperception that it was going out over the public address, it was not. They were using the phones to contact the classrooms. But now that it's been brought to their attention, certainly, trying to choreograph that as seamless as possible. I, I think we'll, they'll attempt to do it. What luck we'll have, I don't know, but. I was just wondering, um, I attended two out of the three Mental Health Mondays and I thought they were excellent. Um, if we could get an update, maybe at the next meeting, just of what the attendance looked like for those three sessions. I know some of them were held twice in a day. Um, any feedback we received from community stakeholders and just what the next steps are, if this was deemed a successful program, will we continue this until the next marking period? Anecdotally, I've heard nothing but positive comments about it. And I know uh, Will has prepared uh, the statistics on the different courses and pushing into the classes. I believe the last one we have is October, November, but as December comes forward, I can share that with the board. And Dr. Tice, were they recorded by any chance? The Monday sessions? No. I don't know. Any additional questions? Okay, we'll move on then to committee and representative updates. So audit finance is meeting on the 23rd. Um, community relations is meeting February 7th. Uh, facilities is meeting January 26th. Dan, did you have anything additional? Okay. Um, and policy is meeting on it's tomorrow actually. Speaking of that, not to do housekeeping now, but will we have quorum for policy, right? Oh, there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I don't think we would have a Legislative liaison update tonight. Um, Victoria, do you have a report for us this evening? Yeah, Thank I you. just have a few little things. Um, so with Dance Marathon and the MCs, just a few updates with that. We just hosted Pink Out for a basketball game against CNS last Friday, and $5,000 were raised at that game for Dance Marathon through all the shirts and just a few games during the game and then just donations. And then another thing coming up this Saturday is the MCs are hosting handball tournament just to keep building their funds up, send as many kids to camp as possible and get to the 100,000 if they can. And then 
last weekend, Friday and Saturday, CNY MUN was hosted. And from what I've heard from other students that participate, around 600 people attended. And it was a good experience. Got lots of awards for FM. And that's all I have. Thank you very much. All right, moving um, on to new business, item 3.01, approval of the minutes for the December 12th regular meeting. Is there a motion that the Board of Ed approve the minutes of the regular meeting held on December 12th, 22, as presented? I know there's something, but we have to get the motion first. Thank you, Daryl. Second from... <laughs> From Rebecca, okay. So you had pointed out in the minutes um, that it stated, oh, try to find the right, the exact verbiage. Uh, it's item 2.05. Sorry, my computer's just taking a little minute to open up. But basically it was that we didn't make a decision to halt the. I mean, I would just, based on our discussion and some consensus tonight, um, rather than saying agreed to suspend, suggested a brief suspension, or yeah, I just mm -hmm. okay. Any other changes, issues with the meeting uh, minutes? Confused on one part, um, and it came from Heidi's letter that had referenced conversation she had with somebody after public comment on December 12th. Heidi was not actually at this meeting on the 12th, right? Because she's not listed. I didn't recall her being here. Mm -hmm. So she was here with Dr. Carmen to answer any questions about the RFP. So she's not listed as present. I just want to make sure that was. Okay, go ahead. No problem. Okay, so um, is there a motion to approve the revised minutes? Thank you, Cynthia. And a second from Sarah. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please indicate aye. Aye. No one's opposed or abstain. All right. <clears throat> Item 3.02 is there a motion to approve the minutes of the special meeting held on December 16th? Is there a motion? Sarah and Daryl, any discussion? All those in favor, please indicate aye. Aye. Anyone opposed or abstaining? One abstention. Uh, next, item 3.03, .03, the NISBA policy transition, the 6,000 series policies in first reading. Is there a motion <coughs> that the Board of Education hereby moves the 6,000 series policies into second reading? Thank you, Cindy, and a second from Sarah. Discussion? <coughs> I have a few questions, but I'll, I'll send those between first and second, but mostly, why are all the associated regs stricken out? Keeping the current regs, but they're all redlined out on the doc we were provided with. But most of the, I'm just confused because most of these policies are local policies, so there wouldn't be. I can provide some supplementary documents to the policy to the board later in the week. That would be great. Thank okay. you. I'd be happy to do that. I was just very, so the, this is the NISBA packet for those that has NISBA's proposed regs crossed out, Correct. keeping local regs where they exist. Correct. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Any further question or discussion? All those in favor, please indicate aye. Aye, and no one's opposed or abstaining. Next, item 3.04, <coughs> approval of consulting agreement. Is there a motion that it be resolved that the Board of Education of the Fayetteville Manley Central School District authorizes the superintendent to execute an agreement with Jeffrey Gordon for consulting services through December 31st, 2023 in an amount not to exceed $20,000? Is there a motion? Thank you, Daryl. And second from Dan. Any discussion? 
All those in favor, please indicate aye. Aye. And no one's opposed or abstaining. Next, um, item 3.05, appointments. Is there a motion that it be resolved that the Board of Education of the Fayetteville Manly Essential School Dis District makes the following appointments effective February 1st, 2023, as presented? Is there a motion? Thank you, Cindy. Second from Sarah. Any discussion? So these are just switching persons, you know, because Jeff is leaving and Lisa's coming. So, all right. All those in favor, please indicate aye. Aye. And no one's opposed or abstaining. Okay. Item 3.06, designations. Same uh, reasoning here. Is there a motion that it be resolved that the Board of Education of the Fayetteville Manly Central School District make the following designations effective February 1st, 2023, as presented? Is there a motion? Thank you, uh, Sarah, and second from Rebecca. Any discussion? All those in favor, please indicate aye. Aye. And no one's opposed or abstaining. Excellent. Next, under board development, Oops. we have an upcoming retreat, 23rd at the high school, 409. Um, as Dr. Tice mentioned, he's got, um, the DEI committee representation has been finalized, so people will be getting their notifications. And once he finalizes um, the folks who are going to be facilitating that, we'll get that information out to everyone as well. Um, we've already had discussion about the DEI committee and the mental health committee, so next step is if we can, we'll get emails out to people to see who's interested. Although there were board members who already said they were interested in the ad hoc DEI committee who are on that committee, so um, we can let board members know that because if you don't want to be on the DEI committee because you want to be on the mental health committee, then let us know so we can move folks around. Because right now the people who express interest in the DEI task force are already on there. And I'm assuming those people would be on the DEI um, ad hoc committee. So if there's any um, one who wants to move anything around and switch committees, then please let me know. So anyone who expressed interest is on the task force? I believe it's everyone who ex expressed interest. Which would be you, How many? myself, um, Daryl, and Cindy. Sarah. Sarah. Is it Cindy? Or Sarah. Sarah. Sorry. There we go. I do, if you've got the time and we've got the, <laughs> let's see who's interested first. I want to give priority to, I want to overload with board members to people who aren't on this committee, but if we don't have that much interest and, you know, why not? I don't think that's an issue. Hmm? Right, if people wanted to be on both of those. But I'll put you down for the mental health committee right now. <laughs> okay, all right, we'll get that taken okay. care of tomorrow. Thank you. Were there other mental health? Committee members, Dan. Dan. <laughs> so, is your priority the mental health? Which one is your Which one is your preference? <laughs> okay, well, we'll make it for you. Okay, we're <laughs> good. Available to be on one of them. Okay. So depending on what everybody else's preferences are. Okay, got it. Um, uh, did we miss it? Daryl, you're good with one or did you? Okay. All right, thank you so much. Okay, moving on to working agenda items. So we've got the Veterans and Senior Citizen Tax Exemptions presentation at the February 13th meeting. Um, if we can make sure we get um, an email to that, the, the gentleman who spoke at the meeting, because I told him we would let him know when we talked about that. Um, electric bus transition on February 13th. So there was a lot of community um, interest in that. We got a lot of emails. So if we could put something, I think, on our social media, on the website, just so people um, can flag that and know that that's going to take place uh, due to the level of interest in that. Uh, good old Senate Bill 151 is there. And then updates from students, outreach to students. I think that's kind of some ongoing um, piece. Anyone else got anything for that? No? OK. 
Okay, moving on to potential considerations for future. Oh, sorry, that was out. Nope, no, it wasn't. Uh, school start time bill, security update, and future planning for UPK program. So we, um, we had a presentation on the UPK program. Um, the security update. The RFPs will be going. Okay. Okay, and the school start time bill. Nothing there really. That we'll just wait and see what happens with that one. Okay. Anyone else have anything under potential considerations for future meetings? Okay. Uh, future meetings calendar. Uh, once again, that retreat on the 23rd, budget workshop on the 13th. Um, future meetings, oh, dates to remember. Ah, the musical's on there. That's always good to see. March 3rd, 4th, 10th, and 11th. Okay. All right, moving on to um, the consent agenda. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? Thank you, Daryl. Second from Sarah. Um, all those in favor, please indicate aye. Aye. And no one's opposed or abstaining. All right, next on the agenda is executive session. So is there a motion to move into executive session? We have two items. One is the discussion of a collective bargaining, FMTA, and the other one is the employment history of a particular individual. Is there a motion? Thank you, Cindy. Second from Rebecca. Any discussion? All those in favor, please indicate aye. Aye. And no one's opposed, abstaining, or abstaining. So we're gonna move into executive session and we will not have any further public um, work after that. We'll adjourn right after executive session. Thank you.